Hello, everybody. Welcome to EBCO's Executive Book Club, June 2020, live from our own individual headquarters. We are still distancing right now. Um, we're so happy to have you for Zero Waste, Principles and Best Practices for Reducing Waste. As you know, it's been a while since we did book club, and we're really glad to have you back. Our entire EBCO team is still at home, and now with, unfortunately, the rise in cases in Texas and many other cities around the United States, it looks like we will be at home for the foreseeable future. So this is our attempt at doing our fun, exciting, and inspired book club from our very own homes. And you can see we're, we're testing out our EBCO backgrounds. So a little new tech in here, a new experience, but the same book club, the same environment, the interactions that we love. We're so happy to have you on today. And we're so glad to have the opportunity to connect with you all. Please use the chat box if you have any questions or comments for us. Um, we're just really excited to engage today. So thank you again. Today we're digging into the Zero Waste Life book. And as you know, we select books when we think about the personal level. So what would inspire innovation, marketing, and trend professionals in a personal way, but that can also expand into your work life? So thinking about the innovation perspective, the trends that are changing and driving industry or changing consumer behaviors, things that we can be doing as professionals and personally. And so we think that what the topics today, zero waste is very inspiring. Um, and it's also very relevant to where we are now as we really look at the things that we interact with daily because we're so much more in tune with our own personal and daily lives. All right, so stay tuned until the end because as you know, we do love to give things away and we have a couple of really cool products today that we will give away at the very end of this webinar. So for those of you that are new joining us, we always love to have new people on our book club. We are from Austin, Texas. That's where EBCO is from. And we are a consulting firm. We work with companies across all industries, very large companies primarily. We work on in innovation initiatives to think about what's happening next. We've been doing a lot of work actually as of late in the last few months thinking about what that, that post COVID world will look like. We've also been tracking along with our clients who are thinking of 2021, 2022, and far beyond when uh, things will hopefully be back to normal in some certain way, some new way possibly. So yeah, we work across all major industries, CPG, food and beverage, personal care, everything that you can imagine. And just so you know, a little side note, one of the main reasons, if you, if you hadn't heard this before, that we do book club is because we really want to provide a lot of information, a lot of value to our community. And our community is the innovation and marketing professionals like yourselves, people who use trends to drive change and innovation within your organization and for the greater populace. And we see this as an opportunity where you can get to know about us, our style, how we think, but also potentially engage with us after these book clubs. So once we get into this topic, if we can pique your interest, we would love to do a follow-up call 15, 30, 15 to 30 minutes, be able to introduce ourselves more in depth, provide some case studies and show you the type of work that we do and see if there's any opportunity to engage with you, to see what type of initiatives you're working on or the things that you're tackling, the questions that you have going on internal to your organization. And that's what really makes these book clubs exciting is be able to reach out to many of you and then follow up with some some few very specific conversations. So hopefully we'll be hearing from some of you uh, post, post this webinar. So our big question today is, have you heard of the zero waste lifestyle before reading this book? So not the book necessarily, but just this idea of zero waste. If you have, go ahead and put it in the chat box. We just wanna see you know, how many people have engaged in this topic or really thought about it before. Um, it's definitely something that Kaylin and myself have thought about. We've implemented a couple of things in our office and as well as in our personal life. Um, it can be a huge change, but it can also be a way of ingenuity, uh, thinking about how we use materials, and of course, having an impact on the environment and feeling less wasteful in our personal lives. Well, that's cool. It looks like a lot of a lot of you have heard about zero waste before. One term that we'll talk about today is be, being resource positive or resource negative. Um, so there's different terms that are coming out around, instead of just being neutral, how do you actually go above and beyond and put something back into the environment or do something that's proactively beneficial. So while we're talking about zero waste today, it could be really interesting to think about a future where all companies are resource negative. Um, so something that I think we'll hear about in the coming years for sure. So we selected a zero waste life. Um, we thought this was a really inter 
interesting interpretation. If you've read the book already or skimmed through it, you'll notice that there's different categories that she covers. She goes everything from travel to the kitchen to um, different lifestyle behaviors that you could have. And what we liked is a lot of times when we think about innovation, if we reverse engineer behaviors that we already see consumers engaging in, a lot of times we come to new products, new services that are beneficial for that end user, especially because even in the book, she says it's sort of maddening how much effort you would actually have to spend to live a zero waste lifestyle. So it takes a lot of commitment. So with that, while we have some very progressive users of this lifestyle and people that really believe in zero waste, we also have a whole swath of consumers that still want convenience and still want things that are going to be manageable within their lifestyle and everything else that they're thinking about. It took nearly two years of monthly sales to rise from 50, from 58 billion to 68 billion. Between February and April of this year, sales jumped another 10 billion. Online retail is going insane right now, and the rapid rise in e-commerce is creating a demand for sustainable packaging solutions. So I don't know about you, but in this time when we've been doing a lot more ordering on Amazon, it's crazy how much content in terms of this type of packaging has just stacked up in the garage, or in some cases for people who live in apartments and stuff, stacked up in the corner and what to do with all these boxes. Um, so it's definitely something that's been on everyone's mind during this time of rapid increase in online retail. Yeah. And just to point out that stat, I mean, that's pretty phenomenal when you think that it took two years, what it only took three months or so to do during COVID. That's why we see um, probably so many of you on the line focusing on your e-commerce strategy, thinking about new direct to consumer models, thinking about ways that the business can become more sustainable when we go through crisis periods like this, but also we've seen that COVID's really been an accelerant. So it's an accelerant force that's causing um, new strategies to come into play, businesses to basically hustle at the speed of an entrepreneur um, and also start to redirect and reallocate resources to, to new ventures and, and new business streams. So that's exactly what we're seeing during this time. So thinking about COVID and the complications that come about from what we've seen, the surge is partially offset lower use and reusable consumer goods due to concerns around COVID-19. But some states and cities, so thinking about Illinois, Massachusetts, San Francisco, they've banned reusable bags at grocery stores while Starbucks has put a moratorium on filling reusable mugs. And, you know, germs and spread is a, is a big cause of this change so rapidly. We can see how fast uh, companies can make changes like this based on what consumers are demanding and also just the health of the populace. Yeah. And we keep seeing like um, news articles around even how much gloves, disposable gloves and PPE that are being thrown away, which obviously is very necessary during this time, but it also creates this really interesting dichotomy of behaviors because prior to COVID, everyone was moving towards this more sustainable future. So a lot of companies making huge pledges to reduce their waste, to become a circular economy, or to ultimately move to everything biodegradable in terms of packaging. And now we're seeing a shift of safety and sanitization and the healthcare industry and different cases where it is better to have disposable for health and safety. So it's an interesting juxtaposition that we feel like we'll see through the end of the year. But ultimately, sustainability could have the same bubble point that we experienced with COVID, which is we will be faced with some reality at some point that we have to change our behavior um, in order to be able to sustain the lifestyles that we have. Um, so that's what a lot of experts predict when they think of fall off scenarios, similar to a lot of experts that predicted what would happen if we had a pandemic. Um, so it's interesting to think about it through the sustainability lens versus a virus lens. And then, of course, the topic of plastic. This is as big of a problem as ever. And something that was addressed in the book a lot was what to do with plastic. And right now, 40% of plastic that's produced as packaging is only used once and then thrown away. And I know this is something that weighs heavily on a lot of us and we see it in our daily lives, but 40% is quite high. And I know the book offered some really good solutions on, on what to do about plastic. And 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic has been produced globally to date. And that affects a lot of the categories that many of you uh, participate in and many of you work on daily. So some companies demonstrate that sustainability can still thrive. Loop is an e-commerce platform that delivers groceries and cleaning supplies directly to consumers' doors in reusable containers. And here's how it works. Consumers order products from Loop's online store. And these are products that you're very familiar with from Nestle, from Clorox, from other large companies. These products are in reusable containers and they're delivered right to your door. And then once the products are used, they'll pick up the empties and containers are sanitized, filled, and redistributed. So we can think about how this might be a model that could be widespread and used 
uh, at least nationally and potentially globally eventually uh, in many different scenarios to reduce the use of single-use plastics. And extra caution is required. So they have a professional reuse system in which the packaging is sanitized. Now thinking towards the future, this could be something that people are going to have to dig into and really learn about in order to truly trust that the sophisticated chemistry and technology that they're using is enough to actually sanitize it in a way that makes consumers feel safe. Yeah, just building on this, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with even TerraCycle. So we're seeing new applications and new business models for recycling, especially now that there's been um, many articles and um, opinions and even expertise around China not taking recyclables anymore. So we see new systems coming into play. So it's not uncommon now to go into a natural beauty store where, you know, that consumer um, has a lot of the same values of being sustainable, using natural products. And you'll actually see a natural beauty recycling station specifically for that consumer. So they can come in, bring their products so not the same model as Loop, but we're definitely moving into this state where we're seeing more companies in this space and new suppliers, new networks, um, new s- ecosystems, essentially, that keep consumers in a loop, but also reduce the burden on them to figure out how to recycle something or how to reuse a product. So in summary, before we dive into the key categories that we'll be reviewing today, manufacturers, retailers, and consumers can see the value in reducing waste but we also have to take into account that consumers want an experience as close to disposability as possible, thinking about ease and convenience. So when there's too big of a barrier there, we all see that those systems don't necessarily gain traction in a widespread way. Uh, So we always have to think of ease and convenience when we're thinking about how can we reduce uh, the waste that we're producing. All right, and so for the really exciting part, what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna look at zero waste foundational principles. We're going to look at smart solutions for waste reduction. We're going to look at items made to disappear and maintenance as waste reduction. Great. So we'll jump into our first section where we're going to talk about zero waste foundational principles. So throughout the book, they talk about this kind of foundational understanding of what is a zero waste lifestyle and also how can we really expand upon this behavior set and really adopt this in terms of our culture, in terms of our lifestyle values. And so I thought that was an interesting part of the book. It seems like once you reduce one area in your life, you're going to most likely start to look at other areas that you can analyze and ultimately improve upon. And it's interesting contrast because we also see that in categories like naturals where consumers tend to replace one product that they find out is toxic, maybe not as good for them. It has something in there that's concerning, whether they heard it from an influencer or the news or just somebody they know. And then they start to replace that in other areas of their life. So Zero waste tends to be a similar behavior pattern that we had. Um, So in terms of um, the author, you can see here that she says, zero waste living may seem impossible, overwhelming, and downright insane. And to some degree it is, I'm not going to lie. And I laughed at this because reading the book, there's definitely things in there that just seem almost like incredibly cumbersome. Like the fact that you would create your own version of all your extracts or make all of your own natural beauty products, your own cleaners. It's, it's almost like a lot of us could probably laugh, like who has the time to do all of that unless you're incredibly passionate about it and have a, have a system or background in it. But it is a behavior set that's really hard to adapt to. It would almost you know, require widespread change. And uh, my husband was telling me that Al Gore lives on a farm where he actually is carbon positive. So he might be one that <laughs> is living this lifestyle. But um, this is something that I think we still are left with a wide swath of consumers that want to engage in behaviors that are positive for the environment and zero waste, but it's overwhelming when you think of where to start and ultimately what's going to have the biggest impact. All right. So for our first pop quiz, you know, we love these by committing to a zero waste lifestyle. You must immediately purge all plastic items from your home, reuse the plastic items you already own, replace all plastic items with glass or do nothing. Just refresh and start new. Go ahead and answer this poll. It looks like we have some answers across all four. We have someone who said, just do nothing. A couple people said, do nothing. Of a lot of people, 75% of you are saying, reuse the plastic items that you already own. And then a couple of you are saying, purge plastic or replace them with glass. In fact, the answer is, and the big reveal, (laughs) it is reuse the plastic items you already own. Because think about it, if you're committing to a zero waste lifestyle, you have to immediately find ways to deal with what's already in your physical presence. So if you purge all perfectly useful items, that's sort of negating the reasoning behind the zero waste life in the first place. So go ahead, find those plastic items, the ones that are usable and begin reusing them immediately. 
Yeah, and it's interesting because we'll talk about this a little bit later, but, and we actually sent this in a pre-read email, but there's a lot of thought leaders in this place, like Lauren Singer, who has a package-free shop in New York. And what's interesting is she started off in this kind of like trashes for tossers lifestyle blog. She started selling her own homemade detergent that is made out of natural and, and I think zero plastic. And then now she has a store that sells items that help you be zero waste. So there is something kind of ironic, I guess, in the sense that you're selling products that ultimately help you live zero waste. But that is something that um, we're seeing is kind of all of these new product and service opportunities as a result of moving towards a more sustainable future. So in terms of some of the zero waste principles for reusing plastics, so one is to, as Aaron mentioned, reuse all of the items, wear them out, and then essentially replace them with eco-friendly options. Um, so we'll be talking about new plastics, new materials, um, new chemical products that we're seeing in terms of innovation um, on a molecular front. And then also start to assess the mess. So keep a tally of your trash. Notice where you're having the biggest opportunities to reduce your waste. So it could be if you're packing your lunch a lot, which most of us, maybe, I don't know if you're packing it to go into your front room or if your office has started to institute at least um, a smaller percentage of going back to the workforce. Um, but thinking about areas where you're using items repeatedly and then ultimately throwing them away at the end of the day. So we've even seen um, some products that are reusable paper towels. We'll be talking about some different formats out there. I don't think any brand's a clear winner in that space yet. It's sort of very fragmented. Um, and just different types of materials that ultimately help with that same end use. So in terms of another quote here that came from the book, Americans throw away roughly 50 billion, mostly plastic bottles per year. And that's not even figuring in other types of disposable drinking vessels like coffee cups. Um, so again, just showing that um, trash again is a huge problem that's very pervasive right now in our culture and how we consume products and really is, um, they've said sustainability is one of the biggest risks to capitalism that we have in the future uh, because the ability for entrepreneurs, for businesses to have something to sell to a consumer is almost a direct, in direct opposition to what sustainability and zero waste and minimalism is all about. Um, so this, I really like that the book talks about and has a lot of different things that you can do um, because I think that ultimately gives us more opportunities when we think of what could look like a sustainable business model in the future for a lot of these categories. So for plastic waste that needs disposing, a key challenge is breaking down the materials. So we see companies in the sustainable space already addressing this issue. So bioselection, they bring together innovations in recycling, chemistry, and material science to create new sustainable materials. They use a chemical process to break down plastic and create a polyester-based TPU that can be used in footwear products, fashion, apparel, labels. So you can see it has a whole bunch of different applications. So they might be a supplier or partner um, for many of you. And one of the things that their website is actually really great um, for, I think, being on the supplier side, sometimes where you often don't see um, the best websites. Um, and they talk about this process of chemical upcycling with zero compromise. And they talk about molecular at, or innovation at the molecular level. So I thought that was really cool. Um, they just had a really great take on material science and how to make that value proposition very strong. And then ultimately how they're helping break down plastic for all of these new functions. Um, so we expect to see a lot of players keep emerging in this space. Um, and we've seen this in other categories where sort of this science lens is coming back in. We're even seeing that in beauty where you see a lot of lab created ingredients that's happening in food and beverage. So now we're starting to see lab created um, in terms of just every end use product. And I think that message will start to come out more and more to the consumer. Another one is Green Mantra. So they've developed a proprietary process that transforms hard to recycle plastics, such as grocery bags, shrink wrap, bottle caps, milk jugs, shampoo bottles, into a high value wax, grease, lubricant, and other specialty chemicals. These wax products can be applied into coatings, plastics, adhesives, roofing, like we see in this picture, paving, and the ink industry. So taking something that is trash and normally um, they wouldn't be able to do anything, it might be an undesirable plastic and they're doing something positive with it, something that has another life cycle. Um, so it could be interesting to think about new partnerships that might be a form where there could be a seemingly interesting connection between like a shampoo bottle and a roofing material. So that could form really interesting partnerships. And we've heard about this kind of at a very broad level in the past when we think of like coffee waste being turned, coffee grounds turning into coffee scrubs or other products where there's sort of a direct link, but it's interesting to see science come in now and form a link where maybe it wasn't as visible to us before. 
So we mentioned Loop Industries before. They upcycle PET plastic into new packaging for the beauty industry, and they're already working with L'Oreal. So we see beauty is a really attractive space. We see a lot of large brands making really sweeping sustainability commitments. So L'Oreal is an example. They've announced that 100% of their plastic packaging will be refillable, reusable, recyclable, or compostable by 2025. I mean, that's a pretty um, bold statement and something that isn't that far away. Um, Unilever has also made similar commitments. Um, Unilever has a lot of great pledges. Um, I feel like they're very progressive in terms of sustainability. So they might be one to check out if you're interested in terms of their innovation mission. Um, and a lot of that is public information um, in terms of going towards um, a more refillable or a circular economy perspective in terms of their business model. So when ready to replace existing plastics, consumers are met with many sustainable options now um, that we see emerging into the market. Um, so some items that come to mind right away, um, especially in the zero waste book, we saw a lot of these products and items that you could immediately get rid of. So things like, you know, having a reusable bag. Um, there's a lot of brands that play in this space. You've probably seen them at a lot of boutiques or your grocery store. At AGB in Austin, um, they really encourage reusable bags. They have a bag tax um, where they'll charge you if you need to use a plastic bag, um, and then they'll give, they can actually give you one. So we're seeing this behavior in more cities, but also it can be somewhat of a fashion statement to have a really cute bag or a bag that is more maybe indicative um, from a style perspective versus just using plastic. We also see reusable water bottles. Um, so obviously like Swell, um, there's now coffee ones, there's soup ones, there's ones that are made for like snacking in the car. So we're seeing more formats in that space. So it'll be interesting. And I'm surprised we haven't yet seen, um, unless some of you know about this, that might be happening. But I'm surprised we haven't yet seen that at a McDonald's or somewhere else where maybe you get something refilled, especially if you're going there regular, frequently or as part of your routine every week. Um, but that could be something that I imagine could be a build on bottles and maybe bags or containers that you might use. We're seeing paper towel alternatives. Um, so as I mentioned, we're seeing like sort of decorative rags that roll up into a paper towel format. We're actually going to be giving away later a Swedish cloth. So an item that you can reuse hundreds of times where you have to throw it away. Um, thinking about cloth produce bags, um, which is another item we're giving away later. Uh, reusable utensils um, is one that I've seen quite a bit on Shark Tank actually. Um, so having reusable utensils that you take with you, um, whether you're eating out or you're just um, with your family and different scenarios. Um, so you can see a lot of these areas, we have already seen some, some trickles of innovation. So we're seeing emerging signs and catalysts that are starting to propel us into this future state. Um, and I think plastic wrap alternative is just one I'll mention where we're seeing like beeswax, we're seeing um, new materials that are reusable. And so ultimately, a lot of these could constitute a threat. Um, you know, if your core business is saran wrap um, or foil, you know, some of these are very threatening. Um, and then on the other end, some of these are, are just great in terms of um, kind of as a society, it's great that we're moving in this ultimate direction. So some examples, as we mentioned, are reusable bags, reusable um, different materials that we're seeing. Um, one of the things that we actually talked about too was just how a lot of zero waste formats are actually much more desirable than their plastic counterpart. I mean, it's much more desirable to have some like cotton netting that's very tactile, that is a different color than just having a plastic bag to carry around with you. So um, there is some desirability, which often then constitute a much higher price point for these items um, versus receiving something for free. Stasher is one um, where we see that, where you know, you're paying eight to $10 for a silicone bag um, because you know that you're gonna be able to reuse it versus you know, maybe paying three to five dollars for a whole can of Ziploc bags. Um, and I think their mission is really interesting. We've seen more competitors in this space now that you can see on the right here that are sort of doing a very similar business model where they're doing a silicone bag that you can use in the microwave freezer. I've even seen them sort of mirror what we see in the makeup space where they stand up on their own and they just make it easier to sort um, and have different functionalities. Um, so this is kind of a fun material trend that we're seeing, but also something that I think a lot of us could think about different use cases that could potentially apply to the category that we're in. Um, bees wrap. Um, so this is one that I always have fun every time I see these. I always end up buying um, buying ones to either give away or to use at home. And it's a natural alternative to plastic wrap. So you could wrap um, cheese, they say half a melon, vegetables, or cover a bowl. And then you steal with the warmth of your hand. Um, it's washable. So um, you can actually continue to reuse this hundreds of times. And it's actually made out of beeswax, um, tree resin, organic jojoba oil. 
And then the packaging that actually comes in is 100% recycled paper and biodegradable cellulose. So again, just showing that even the packaging, the product comes in um, is, is zero waste. Um, and then there are certified B Corp. So we're seeing that more often in the zero waste space too, is this B Corp um, mission and value prop being shared with the consumer. So they know that that company is going above and beyond um, throughout all of the principles. So thinking about some considerations in your own life, what are two to three steps that you could take to help reduce waste immediately? So go ahead and put it in the chat box if you have any immediate thoughts, or how can you at your company, what are two to three steps that you could reduce waste? And think about it. This could be as an employee, as someone who's working, what could you guys do to reduce waste? And this might have some interesting implications if some of you are still working from home. Or what could the company do more holistically as part of your innovation strategy, thinking about how to reduce waste? Maybe it's a different lens in terms of materials or a different way to explore potential product opportunities. So just a lot of ways to open up the door and start thinking about how can we reduce waste, both in our, both in our personal life, but also as innovation and product development professionals. Yes, and we see some comments coming in. Someone's already stopped using plastic wrap. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, I love that. Yeah, absolutely reducing plastic wrap, wrap or even thinking about um, using the reusable towels is just a huge way to reduce waste, but also something that is very accessible and easy right now. At work, thinking about social campaigns, composting. Um, it looks like there's some challenges potentially because COVID is here right now, but there's a lot of answers coming in. So just keep up the thinking um, and always think about how we can reduce waste. Yeah, I love this question we got that. Have we seen anything in the middle space where you would use your own container but use a business's disinfection or sterilization process? That's a great, um, just kind of a great thought starter. And we are starting to see that in small doses in different ways. Um, so for example, a lot of child care centers actually have you now wash your child's hands in your hands outside the entrance. And then they sort of sterilize um, your hands with hand sanitizer. So there's a, a process to even enter the building. Um, and we are seeing different, even restaurants kind of take that approach. I would say like in terms of actual like cups and plates, we haven't seen that quite yet. Um, there is talk though about permanent hand washing stations and how even residential and commercial will be reconfigured post COVID to really address sanitization needs. So I could imagine that as we've seen more UV wands and disinfection tools that that could be something that could become more standard. And then as a result, I think they'd start to introduce um, potentially this idea that you have, we're bringing your cups, containers. Um, so that'll be interesting to think about, um, especially um, as we've seen innovation, even in terms of water bottles that now have a UV light to disinfect. Um, so that we definitely see products in that space, but not yet the business linked to it yet. Yeah, and just so you know, if you can, um, when you reply to, the chat box, please do all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comments. And a couple of other interesting comments that came in, reusable containers, people are talking about food delivery services, which is huge right now. How can food delivery have smarter packaging? And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some companies that would love to explore this, thinking about how can take home uh, and also Instacart and different companies that are delivering food right to the house use something better. And then also how can we think about more plant-based materials, new types of materials, thinking about recycling programs um, and reuse pet programs. So lots of really good comments in there. Great. So definitely keep the thoughts coming um, in the chat, but we're going to move on to chapter two, which is thinking of smart solutions for waste reduction. So we're seeing brands and consumers discover new creative waste uh, ways of transforming waste into useful products. So you can see an example here of pulp pantry where they're using um, the juice's other half, as they say, so the pulp that would normally get discarded. I think this is an interesting one because I think this actually emanated from a consumer behavior. So consumers finding ways to reuse like carrot pulp and making maybe carrot, carrot cake or carrot bread with it or banana bread. But we've already seen consumers engage in this behavior. So now brands are thinking of byproducts and other things that they're discarding in, their, in the process to make their own products. And so I think even from... Uh, we talked earlier about that example of biocellid, where they talk about this chemical upcycling. So I think we're going to get to this layer of like sub transparency in the supply chain process and in the manufacturing process where con companies are willing to share this transparent lens of what are we doing with all of our byproducts? Like what kind of partnerships do we have in place to make sure that we're reusing our waste products, that um, we have these unique coalitions and partnerships formed. And I think that's a really exciting space. I mean, I think there's some excitement with waste products, but 
overall, I think there's way more innovation that could happen. We think about other industries being able to leverage a lot of the byproducts we're already making. And I love this quote, trash is only trash if you throw it away. Um, so just rethinking, you know, what are we throwing away? And is there actually a potential second use for this or an innovation that we could think about from a trash perspective? I mean, that'd be a really fun innovation with your team. If you think about everything that gets thrown away in the whole process and like, where now are their partnership, where are their innovation opportunities, where are their product development opportunities. So just thinking about, you know, how can we really redefine what trash means? And also just before we jump into this quiz real quick, a really interesting comment from um, Manini to the group that right now reducing waste is a very individual led approach. And they're posing this question, would it be more scalable if the largest CPGs got together to create some sort of task force to find more sustainable alternatives to current packaging? perhaps the burden should be more on the manufacturers and less so on the individual. And what I find personally very interesting about this comment is I think it's replicated right now with what we're asking people to do around masks. I won't go deep into it because I know it can be very political, but thinking about what it looks like when society puts the onus on individuals versus something that's more scalable and more sustainable as a holistic approach and how that can have a bigger impact. So um, very interesting question being posed. Now for our pop quiz, which room is the biggest producer of trash in your house? Is it the bathroom? Is it the bedroom, the living room, or the kitchen? All right, good. We see the poll responses are pouring in and it looks like a majority, and I mean a very heavy majority, 97% of you are saying the kitchen and we have a couple of you saying the bathroom. And the answer, in fact, is the kitchen. You're right. And what's really interesting about this, there's a, a ton of memes out there right now just because of COVID specifically about how people are changing out their trash more than they ever have before. They're literally changing out one or two times a day when maybe before it lasted longer. But it's because we're living in this space on a continual basis. And some of you have other individuals in your households or you have children in your households and the amount of trash that's being produced is, is off the, off the charts at this moment in time. Yeah. And I love, um, this was in the book, but it is the home of the garbage can, is it not? So just showing that that's where our behaviors are reinforced because a lot of us have our largest trash can in the kitchen area. Um, and that's why we tend to see a lot of zero waste innovation happen first in the kitchen. We're already seeing a lot of food companies, you know, have waste products or thinking about how to tell that waste story. Um, we're seeing a rise in composting, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but it's interesting to think about where behaviors are reinforced and ultimately when someone's sort of a relationship with their trash can takes place, because most of it is happening in the kitchen, um, maybe some for the garage, but I think most of it is happening around food storage, um, food consumption, when we come from the grocery store. So when we're throwing away packaging, a lot of that is happening in the kitchen space. So we see at home, composting is a key way of reducing kitchen waste. So composting can often seem intimidating at first um, to consumers. It's an area that, you know, the past we haven't really seen taken off. It might seem sort of like a very small group of consumers are actually engaging in this practice. Um, but there's been more education around this idea of organic waste. Um, we're seeing a lot of new business models in this space. We're seeing a lot of energy and excitement. The book goes on to talk about composting. Um, and so it's becoming a less scary behavior to engage in. It's something that is becoming more accessible um, and something that a lot of you may even have in your offices or at the headquarters. You might have a composting, actual trash can for composting. Um, and so we're seeing that it's now starting to trickle into consumers' homes and something that we definitely see on the rise. We also see um, it making a lot of business sense for companies to move in this direction as there's more pressure to really nix virgin plastics. And companies have really wised up to the sustainability trend and also thought about ways to leverage it. Um, even a lot of times from a personal perspective, you know, having a passion for this area, but also there's on popularity when we talk about plastics and we have a lot of brands educating consumers. So when we start to see more proliferation of brands like Rothy's talking about plastic bottles, we have other companies making massive pledges. It just starts to get into the mainstream awareness that this is a progressive direction that we're going in. Um, and that's why we start to see much more innovation. We see investment and ultimately behavior change. Um, so Eco Eno, if that's how you pronounce it, um, this is a Hong Kong based company that makes compostable packaging from leftover bamboo and sugarcane pulp. And they recently announced the closing of a 6 um, million series A1 funding from Alibaba. So we already see Alibaba making investments um, similar to what we might expect from an Amazon as an example in terms of potentially new packaging solutions that 
when we think of the future of e-commerce and how much waste is in, inside of that experience, it'll be interesting to see how that transforms over time. And I know there's already initiatives in terms of like packaging things in a way that there's not all of this extra room. Um, so they have a program already for that. Um, but the challenge a lot of times with that we see in e-commerce is part of the experience is unboxing and having this, this marketing experience essentially while you're opening up all of your products. And so a lot of direct to consumer brands do a good job with that, but inherently that also creates a lot of waste. Varden is another one where they use a natural molded pulp fiber, such as sugarcane, to create a sustainable, high performing packaging and they aim to replace the plastic coffee pod. They recently received um, 2.2 million in funding from Verizon's Ventures. Um, so again, just rethinking common formats with something that's more sustainable um, and talking about that material story. Pulpworks is another one. They use byproducts from sugarcane, bamboo, and rice, and they can create packaging for all types of goods from electronics to food to personal care and medical devices. So thinking about some more questions based on what we're learning here, upcycling seems like a lot of work. How might it apply to the company that you're in? What could you do internally that would be upcycling? How is the idea of zero waste and upcycling impacting consumers in your category? So thinking about the packaging or the waste or anything that is within the ecosystem of your products, your services, your packaging, what might be an upcycling opportunity? And what is my company's biggest waste product and how might it be reused? So we've obviously seen a lot of ingenuity um, as of late looking at how to maximize resources and supply chains and manufacturing capabilities to do new things during this time of COVID and as just a typical innovation strategy. But how might, instead of just looking at new ways to maximize our resources, how might we also upcycle the waste that we have? It could be a whole new opportunity, a whole new avenue of product development potentially. Yeah, I love these questions and comments coming in. So just the process of creation. Um, somebody mentioned about sugarcane. Is it really more ecological. That's a really great point and something that we see in terms of storytelling a lot of times on manufacturers' websites or brands' websites around really making sure that the process is not just greenwashing and saying that it's more sustainable. Um, so I think we're getting to a critical point where a lot of the solutions that we're seeing um, come out, um, greenwashing has been a trend for over a decade, if not more. And so a lot of companies are trying to point to the fact why this process is actually better for the environment or why you're you know, actually reducing water overall throughout the whole process. Um, and we actually see this movement, um, we we're seeing this movement in California, even where consumers are talking about not wanting to drink almond milk anymore because of um, how much water it uses, but also killing the bees. Um, so there was a lot of connection points to like, even though in my mind, almond milk may be better than cow milk, I'm not going to consume it if ultimately I find out that there's some sustainable fallout happening. So we do see consumers as you know, as influencers, as um, social media, as different information streams eventually make them aware, there's some fallout that tends to happen. So um, we expect that um, kind of as a larger zero waste movement, we're hopefully moving to more progressive solutions that are ultimately solving the problem and not just greenwashing. So in terms of items that are made to disappear, so with this increased focus on reducing waste, some consumers and companies are leaning towards products that fully disappear after use. So we're going to start off with a poll here. So how many items does the average U.S. home contain? 550,000, 200,000, 300,000, or 150,000? It's just, I, I, I love this pop quiz because it's just astounding to me that we're even starting in the hundreds of thousands in terms of how many items our homes contain. It's pretty remarkable. So about half of you are saying 300,000. You're feeling good about that. Um, and then it's pretty spread across the other three. So the answer in fact is, which half of you have said, 300,000. Yes. So the average home contains 300,000. And you can imagine there's a full spread from people to smaller, more dense city living to much larger homes. So you can sort of gauge where you might be on this scale. And it might have you thinking about, wow, I have a, I have a ton of stuff in my house. <laughs> yeah. And what's interesting is being in Austin, we, I see so much proliferation of new storage unit business models. I mean, there's been so much innovation even in storage facilities, especially in cities that are having high growth patterns like Austin. And so it really does reinforce this fact that we just have so much stuff. So even from a business model perspective, I love those business models that talk about um, reusing toys or 
um, party gear or things that maybe you only use seasonally, um, but there's a lot of innovation opportunity. Um, we feel in areas where there could be a whole reuse market. Um, when we did research a few years ago on luxury goods, one of the interesting things is that watches now the resale or the reuse market of luxury watches is actually, I think it was like almost parallel to the actual luxury watch market. It was, it was higher. Um, so it just shows you that there's entire new markets that can be created with things that can be reused ultimately. Um, so it will be really interesting to see the innovation that we see in that space. So we talked about items that help reduce waste. And now we're going to talk about items that often are disposable that we just throw away after one use. So things like paper towels, coffee, coffee filters, paper napkins, disposable plates, um, plastic wrap, sandwich bags, trash bags, tea bags, coffee pots, dish sponges, dish soap. Um, and some of these obviously after a few usage, but most of the time they're meant to be disposable in our minds. Um, so we're seeing companies now think about ways that we could make items that are disposable into something that's either edible, biodegradable, plastic free, or it's meant to maybe last longer. This one from Candy Cutlery is actually a sweet item that you might have with dessert or drink, and then it functions as something that you can eat. So if you can imagine like a gummy texture um, or even a sucker texture potentially. Um, EcoShell is one where they have a technology that uses sugarcane again and cornstarch. Um, and they have, they talk about the time that um, the products actually take to biodegrade. And so um, they also talk about the microorganisms that would feed on their products. So again, connecting the dots about the process that this will go through to um, go back to the earth. And I've actually done zip lining before in California where um, all of the drinks that we had along our tour were actually made out of corn. And they were really like flimsy feeling like you could almost feel like you could like crush it yourself. And they talked about the fact that it was really against their mission to give you a plastic container um, because they were trying to save trees. And they talked about um, ultimately as an eco-conscious company, they wanted to have only products during that whole tour that um, were biodegradable. So I thought that was an interesting connection. And one of the times I've seen kind of a more unique product um, in that type of experience. Lollyware is one um, that we've seen several times. They tend to be an innovator that's noticed in the space. They make edible seaweed straws on like paper straws that get mushy. I think we've all experienced a paper straw that's like collapsed on us or it doesn't work um, as we're having a, maybe a, a yummy latte or an iced coffee beverage. Um, but Lollyware's product looks and feels like plastic. And it, if it ends up in the ocean, it quickly dissolves. So that's really exciting, um, especially when we think of ocean plastics and wanting to reduce that problem. Um, not plastic, <laughs> you can see it's kind of interesting, not pla is made from seaweed and plants and is biodegradable. And then they also have that OHO packaging you see there, that little squishy thing. It's small and flexible, so it could be perfect for a beverage or a sauce. Um, so you could throw it and it would dissolve as you're cooking and not alter the taste of what you're actually making. So let's think about talk, talking to colleagues about creating zero waste and how can we challenge ourselves. You could potentially do things such as avoiding disposable packaging or utensils. Remember there's those wide like, you know, see who can lose the, the biggest percent of their body weight type challenges or just other challenges that you have internally. And we were thinking things like that. Um, you know, how can you avoid disposable packaging or simplifying your product line and starting to present these ideas in your meetings for product development and for innovation initiatives or reduce the resource consumption at the workplace? Is there something around something in the break room or something around printing or just some other resource that you're using in abundance that's caught your eye? What kind of challenge can you and your colleagues, and maybe there's something you can do at home. If most of your colleagues are at home or working from home, I just saw Shannon mention that um, where she works is now allowing people to permanently work from home even after COVID. So maybe there's some challenges that could be company-wide but impact what we do at home. So lots of different ways to think about this. Yeah, and I'll just tag team on that. So for those of us um, working from home or kind of thinking about our summer plans, there prior to actually COVID happening, we had covered this, I think, on our favorite things webinar. Um, Lonely Planet had this book about micro trips. So this idea that there was a rising movement to slow down travel because of the carbon footprint of taking a long airplane ride could actually offset pretty much any other recycling behavior that you had for a whole year. Um, so going on a plane is by far, you know, the worst thing we can do in terms of footprint. And so they talked about different ways to explore cities where you live or the region where you live. So if you live in Austin, um, we have some great natural springs that are outside the city. And so they designed all of these little like field trips, fun weekend trips that you could take. 
um, based on where you live. And I thought this whole idea of localization, especially during COVID, is really interesting um, and kind of returning a lot to our regional roots and thinking of micro trips. So that might be a really fun challenge to take um, if you're in your city and thinking about natural destinations. Um, that's a great book to check out if you live in a major metro because they'll have a lot of options for you. Um, but just something that could be a fun uh, zero waste, we'll say in quotation, challenge to take. So we're going to jump into our last section here. So thinking about maintenance as waste reduction. So when working to reduce impact on the planet, sustainable lifestyle choices should include considerations about how to make a home more efficient. Um, and also from a service perspective, there's a lot of innovation potential as well. So this isn't just for the product innovators on the line or those of us that think about physical product creation, but actually thinking about um, new smart technologies and new ways that we can ultimately reduce our impact within our own home. And so we're going to start with this poll here. All right. So by installing a smart thermometer, how much can the average consumer save on air conditioning's cost? Is it 25%, 15%, 5%, 2%? I see a lot of answers coming in. Most of you think that you can save 25% on the cost. Some of you think 15%. So we're definitely swaying on the higher side of savings. But in fact, the answer is... All right, 50% of you said 15%, and it is in fact 15%. So by installing a smart thermometer, you can save 15% on the cost of air conditioning. So we love this quote from the book that the idea of zero waste isn't limited to your trash can. So I think even with the microchip example or your own personal footprint of going to work, um, or even from a service perspective, thinking about how zero waste can potentially play into those areas. So we think of from a service perspective, we already see smart, therm um, we see smart thermostats on the market. Um, we also see smart outlets, plugs, power strips, energy efficient light bulbs, alternative energy sources such as sun or wind turbine energy. So we're seeing a lot of excitement in this space and a lot of these devices that are coming into the home are promising that they're ultimately saving you money or figuring out kind of where there could be energy leakages. So Sense is one where they monitor um, the energy in a home to create more transparency about ultimately what's costing the most energy. You install it directly into an electrical panel and over time it detects other devices. So it starts to learn the signals of the dishwasher, the washing machine, the dryer, the furnace. And then once it's have everything figured out, it's able to identify their unique electrical signal and ultimately track how much energy that device is using. So I think that'd be pretty interesting to see how um, energy efficient certain devices are. But I think also from an IoT perspective um, or an AI perspective, there's some interesting implications here about if one device could ultimately sort of talk to all of those other devices and ultimately get them to coordinate or figure out um, when the best energy usage time is or even make suggestions to a consumer. Like um, there's a high, um, you know, maybe there's a high demand on the grid right now. Um, wait until 6 p.m. to do your dishes. So I think there could be some interesting applications that we'll see down the line as a result of these new technologies. So we also see um, from a service perspective, utility warehouses one where they'll come and replace all of your light bulbs with things that are more energy efficient. So I think that's an interesting service when we think about um, a consumer wanting to replace everything in their home um, and kind of move into this direction, but maybe wanting an expert to do it. Um, and also it has more service component based without having to do all that research yourself. Um, so I think that's one of the things we see with zero waste is it requires a lot of research for all the different categories, which might excite a lot of us on the phone today when we think of research. But um, for some of us, um, research, you know, is not, is not always intuitive, especially just sort of a general lens uh, of most consumers when they're dealing with a lot of other things in their life. Um, and then Trickle Star, this is a seven outlet that helps reduce a home's vampire load. So I love this idea of vampire that it's sucking the energy and you might not even be aware of it. Um, so it's a master control that would switch on or off all of the outlets that are currently on. Um, and then it can remove flow to um, from several associated appliances. Um, and then the setup is as simple as plugging in a normal power strip. So you can see, again, focusing really on the convenience aspect. And real quick, we had an interesting question. Is the book itself made from compostable material or recycled material? and just wondering why it wasn't circulated digitally. And I, I did want to address that real quick. I don't know the exact materials that this book is made of, and I'm going to investigate because I'm just as curious. But also, in the past, we've had a lot of trouble sharing digital books. So once you purchase a digital book, though you have ownership over it, and it's a product that you've purchased, you can't actually share it. And so our thought process with these books is that if you do find something really interesting and you make your way through it, and you make some of these 
life changes, you can then pass this book on to somebody else and it can be reused by that individual rather than going into the digital vortex um, and not being able to, to share it. So uh, physical books um, are still relevant, at least we feel um, at this time, and we hope that you do pass it on and it has a long life after uh, after your experience with our book club and, and after you have the chance to make some of the changes that you are going to make in your own life. Um, okay, so we are wrapping up now. Um, thank you everyone for your amazing participation today. What will it require for your company to reduce the amount of waste, to, waste produced? Thinking about your company from a circular perspective, how might waste be removed from your supply chain, production, and post-use and purchase? These are things for you to consider. What are steps that you could take today that could begin to reduce the amount of waste your company creates? So just some things for you to start thinking about. Um, I do want to reiterate that I have some things to give away right now. So Kayla and I are both going to turn on our cameras. I'm going to tell you what these exciting things are. And I have put all of your names. I, I, I think I forgot to mention this, but I always put everyone's name into um, a little jar. And I just pick them out. And I've already done that while Kayla was talking. And so we have some winners here today. Um, and it's giveaway time. All right. So the first one, Kaylin, you are showing are the produce bags, right? Yes. So this is a produce bag set that you hopefully after COVID um, could take with you to your supermarket or to your farmer's market potentially now. Um, one produce bag set helps to offset 100 plastic bags and something that you could even use in your fridge to help organize your produce with. Perfect. So the winner of this is Pedro G. Pedro, we are going to be sending these bags to you. You can tell us how they go. These are the Save It Produce bags. And this one re reusable produce bag is actually equal to 200 plastic produce bags. So Pedro, have a ton of fun using those. The next product that we are giving away, Kaylin, I'm trying to, we're not next to each other this time. So we have a unique challenge here. It looks like those are the bowls. Yes, these are the bowl yes. covers that help cover okay. up your leftovers. Yes, machine washable bowl covers. So these are sophisticated, simple. They come in really cute patterns. They're environmentally friendly, and they can replace the cling wrap or the foil um, as a product that's disposable. So we have this nice reusable washable bowl cover. And the winner is Louis G, or Louis G. Sorry if I'm saying it wrong, but you are the winner, and we are going to be sending you these machine washable bowl covers. Yay! All right, and the next product that Kaylin has, and we've actually used these a lot, are the beeswax. So these are bees wraps paper. They're easy to use, they're washable, they're all natural way to store food. And again, it replaces the single use plastic right in your kitchen and you can use them 200 to 300 times. And the winner of these is Crystal V. Crystal, Crystal V, these are coming to you in the mail. I hope you enjoy using them just as much as we have. This is a product we really love. And then the final product we're giving away are the Swedish cloths. So what's so cool about these is they come with really cool prints on them. You can actually get them in lots of like country stores um, and you can get them in as souvenirs because they're just, uh, they're really easy to print on and they're really nice. They're elegant, they're whimsical, they're staples for your kitchen. All you have to do is wring it out, let it dry and you can reuse it. So it works great instead of using paper towels. And the winner of this is Linda R. That is our final winner today, Linda R. So I hope that you have a lot of fun using these Swedish disc cloths. They're something that we've actually really enjoyed using in the closet. Um, so that's really exciting. And for the last four minutes, we want to tell you about our two-year anniversary of book club. That's amazing. We've done over eight, I think eight or nine or 10, <laughs> maybe I lost track, book clubs. And we're doing something really exciting. We hope that you'll be as excited as we are. So what we're doing is we're going to send out an email and you'll see this in your inbox that recaps all the book clubs we've done. And I'm sure that there are some that maybe you missed or you weren't able to participate in. And what we're doing is we're offering just in the, in the summer season to get on and do private book clubs with just your team, just your company. So we'll pull out one of the book clubs or it could be one of our other webinars that we've done and we'll adjust it slightly to make it make sense just for your team, depending on your product category, who's going to be participating. And we'll do an intimate conversational session where we'll dig into the content. And if anyone's joining who hasn't been part of that book club, we will send them the book. So if you have an innovation or a marketing team of let's say six to eight people, or there's some people from different departments that you you want to gather together we're going to try this intimate session these these are free by the way I have to always say that anything to do with book club is 
free. It's one of the things that we do for marketing and we love doing it and we're passionate about it as you could probably tell by just how excited I am to be on this webinar today. Uh, so we will be sending an info email on that and you can let us know if there's any topic that's of interest to you and we can get your team on. It's an opportunity for us to learn more about your team specifically, some of the initiatives that you're working on. It gives us a chance to tell you more about EBCO within the context of valuable content, which is always fun, generate a really good conversation. Also, if some of you happen to be remote working right now and you miss some of your colleagues, it could be a really fun, intimate way to pull you back together and talk about something fun. And it's always our hopes that we have the opportunity to chat with some of you one-on-one, -on -one. again, just to reiterate for 15 or 30 minutes to get to know you in a more personal level and see if there's any opportunities for us to collaborate. So there you have it. Watch out for the two-year book club anniversary email. Um, and yeah, we look forward to connecting with you guys and, and doing this as often as we can. Um, it really inspires us, especially um, during this time when we feel a little bit lonely, a little bit isolated. It's nice to feel connected to you all through this webinar and through content that we're really passionate about. Yeah, and just to also reiterate, we sent an email to join the Facebook group. So we're going to start posting announcements in there between book clubs. Um, I mean, some of you work in interesting categories that could potentially inspire one another, or there might be things shared in there that could think about innovation. And a lot of us just come from so many different backgrounds and have so many different areas of expertise. So if you're interested in being in a like-minded group, we're only going to have it for innovation and insight professionals. Um, feel free to join that in the email that we sent out. Um, we'll be making announcements there and um, it'll be, as we go, we'll kind of curate the content based on the group's interests and what we're finding most valuable. Yay. Awesome. Well, everyone have a wonderful day. Stay safe. I hope you're doing well wherever you are. Stay inspired and we will all connect soon. Thanks everyone. Bye.